Today I'm in the virtual studio with Jude, Judy, correct me if I'm wrong, Judy and Peter Bonza. You are tuning in with me from Australia, New South Wales. And it's, it's fantastic because during this little series, we've been going all over the world. And as you'll see, we, we started with Millie in the States, the founder of CODA. But today's conversation, thanks to Catherine White interpreting here for the deaf community here in Ireland, we're going to explore the lives of two people whose work has been predominantly in within communities where they have lived, serving the deaf communities there. What I'd like to do maybe is to start with you, Peter, because if you like, your life then changed when the two of you met. But I can't do your background, the ex the extensive experience that you that you have justice. So if you could just, if you like, start with your early early years as a hearing person born into, if you like, a deaf family. And I know there were, were deaf and hearing people within your extended family environment. So maybe, maybe just fill us in a little bit there. Okay. Uh, it's, it's nice to be with you. Thank you, Janie. Thank you, Catherine, for asking us and setting this up. Um, I was born in Sydney, uh, Australia. Uh, my parents were both profoundly deaf. They went to the same deaf school together. Uh, my mum was the eldest in her family uh, of three children. She then had a hearing brother and then she had a deaf brother. So I have a deaf uncle or had a deaf uncle. They've all passed away now. Um, and he had two deaf children. He had a, a, he had hearing children, but two of his children were also deaf. So I have two uh, deaf first cousins um, and I, and we grew up one street away from each other. So we've grown up very close and we still have contact with each other and see each other whenever we can. Um, there are some deaf people scattered in sort of very, you know, like, may, I don't know, maybe third cousin or, or two generations back there was someone. So deaf people just spotted here and there um, in the family. But my core family were my parents, my uncle and his wife and the two deaf children. Um, yeah, and I lived in Sydney right up until I started work in the Deaf Society there at the beginning of 1980. And uh, then later that year, I met Judy uh, because she was working at the Victorian School for Deaf Children in Melbourne. Um, Judy also came from a deaf family. I'll let her tell you about that. But quite often in the deaf community, you know of each other, but we didn't know of each other. And we were both working in the field of deafness. We had heard about each other because people thought that we would be well suited if we got together. Um, we had mutual friends in each city. And we, both of us being pretty independent and, you know, holding our own ground, said to them nicely, mind your own business, we can look after things ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess they were right. <laughs> In the end, they were right. When we eventually met by, um, by accident, by accident, and we realised, oh, you're the one that they were talking about, and Judy's the, like, you're the one they were talking about. We the connection was there, and yes, so 30, nearly 38 years later, here we are. <laughs> to tell us a little little bit about your your family background, Judy. Um, I'm one of seven children and I'm number six and uh, mum, dad and five of my siblings profoundly deaf and so I grew up in a house that with a much older brother who could hear but he was not interested with the little sister way down the bottom of the chain. Um, that was my life. I was almost 
raised as a deaf child and I was told that I was fluent in the language as young as four years of age. But it wasn't until I went to school and the day that the first day of going to school, I thought I was going to the same school as my siblings. But no, my mother said, no, 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 you're not going to that school. Why? Because you're different. Now I'm talking about being about four and a half and suddenly being told I am different to all the siblings. And she said, no, you have to go to a different school. So when I went there, no one signed. So I went through a very big adjustment and I had to learn, I guess, to speak English because I was able to speak, you know, but I always spoke in Auslan structure and uh, the teacher would, she just took an interest in me. She said, why is it that when I speak to you, you seem to understand, but when you speak, I had trouble understanding you. So she wanted to come and meet my parents to talk about my, my speech and all that sort of stuff. So I thought I was in trouble. But when she met them, she realized I was affluent in one language, which is sign language, but not in spoken English. So she took a personal interest in me she read to me all the time, which I found terribly boring as a kid. And, uh, you know, it was just not fun and animated and, you know, all that expression and everything. Um, and being the girl in the family too, I realised much later that I just naturally assumed the responsibility of being the family interpreter. But... Uh, I wouldn't say interpreting, it was just the communicator. If someone was at the door, mum would say, what, what do they want? And I'd be trying to explain in my younger years, you know, what they wanted or whatever. Um, and so that that's just, you know, and even to this very day, um, Auslan is definitely my first language. And English is my second language. When I get upset or I'm really excited, I go into Auslan. Whereas Peter, he's what I call a double A. And he lived with extended family as well. So he had English, he had sign language, you know, and so, you know, he's a smarty pets. But my first language is <laughs> Auslan. And um, yeah, I struggle sometimes with, I. I know what I want to say, but I just find it easy to do it in Auslan. But I, I sometimes still struggle to this very day. And then I just had this passion to work in the deaf field. And I had long relationships with, um, uh, you know, a few prior boyfriends and things, but they never worked out. I was always the interpreter when, you know, they come to my house and I could never just be me. And then there was issues of, deaf people are more important to you than the relationship. And I went, yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's that was just me. It's part of me. It's a huge part of me. And then when I got to meet Peter, I mean, you know, I was a much older woman then and I just, I had given in to the thought that, you know what, I think I'll just stay single and I can be my own boss and no one can dictate to me anything. But when I met Peter, Gee, it took a while to stop that interpreting role, you know, and he'd go, Judy, I can understand. <laughs> and I thought, he does, he does. And he, he got me, he understood me. And it just made the relationship so natural, so fluid. And even today, you know, if we get upset or annoyed, we can just go in and out of it, either language. And I think that's what's so unique about our relationship. It's really, really smooth. Um, he still never listens to me, but <laughs> I know I'm right. <laughs> it's it's really interesting for me because the one thing that's coming through very strongly, and it's something I suppose I've now a much greater appreciation of, is the ability for somebody from the deaf community, particularly if they they don't have language, is to be able to speak in their first language. Yes. It, it's and it, it's we we had somebody in Ireland, Andrew Geary, who gave an amazing TEDx talk recently. Um, he's he's fighting his constitutional or his the constitutional right for his son to have Irish sign language in the classroom. It, it's a it's 
probably going to be a landmark case here. Wow. But the thing that has stuck out for me in his talk, and I'll send you a link, is what is freedom of speech without language? Yes, yes. As in your own language. And, and a perfect example is whenever my mother had to come to the school, even as a child, I had to explain to them how I was going in school. And then when there was things like, I can remember being so embarrassed about sex education. You know, the mothers would have to come with the daughters and the fathers would have to come with the sons. And I'm sitting there trying to absorb this information on sex education, telling my mother, I have to learn this stuff. And she's going, oh, you know, she just stopped. <laughs> and then I get caught in between and she would be very unhappy or, or happy that I was starting to understand. But it was just something that is so freely open at home to talk about, but not outside in the hearing world. To my mother, that was not acceptable. And it was just an interesting, like I reflect back and think of all those experiences that kids, and I've heard people talk about how, they would actually say to the teacher, what a wonderful child they are at home. And then the mother's actually, or the father is saying, they are so naughty, they never listen to me. <laughs> and they twist the information and manipulate it to their own advantage. And they go home with, you know, all these wonderful glowing reports. But in actual fact, the school might be concerned about something. And the child then manipulates and takes over the power and so, you know, there's all those sorts of things that can go on. I, I could never do that because my mum was so onto everything. <laughs> she could lip, three, lip read through the back of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I swear, I swear. There was no, no way that I could change in, you know, what the teacher had said because she was very good at reading people and and at a skilled lip reader even though she was uh, a fluent signer and, and a profoundly deaf woman but she was good at catching on to the tone of things um so i couldn't i couldn't hide it and i wouldn't dare because the trouble i would be in <laughs> but i was a perfect angel i was always <laughs> honest <laughs> of course you were of course you were uh but it is interesting isn't it because coders as coders, you are the bridge between two worlds. Throughout your upbringing, then in 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 the work that you do, you're you're very much the, that bridge between two worlds. And to for me, as as somebody who is just learning more, each conversation I have with somebody, either as an interpreter or a deaf person through an interpreter, I'm learning more and more about the different bonds that exist. I mean, I, I, I can see as coders, the it, it's almost like an unspoken language that you, you, you and Peter have, because you don't have to explain certain things, there's an innate understanding. And then when I see coders getting together, again, it, it's whether they're by reflex signing at the same time, but they, there's no explanation needed. It is like a language exactly. within a language that is so often unspoken between you. And yet one thing that really saddens me is that with the numbers of children uh, percentage wise who were born uh, hearing to, to deaf adults, it's so many, so many break away. They have nothing to do with deafness. Very few of us um, have this passion to work in the field, uh, to work with the deaf, not just for the deaf. Um, and I find that very sad. And, and I can remember listening to a speaker in Finland um, who spoke about, you've got to look back over where they came from, meaning who were their parents? What was their background? Did they come from a, a deaf rich environment? But most deaf people are born into hearing families, so they don't have that richness about them. And then you understand about who the deaf community say, if you come from a deaf family, you're from royals because you've had that rich 
um, gift. And, uh, you know, oh, and the deaf kids would gravitate to those houses because everyone communicated in the same language. And then they go home, maybe for school holidays or whatever, and they don't get that. And then they grow up frustrated with their family who have not bothered to learn sign language or they see all this laughter and they see all the, the talking, but they ask, what are you laughing about? Oh, it's not important. It's not. And they're dismissed. And so those attitudes fester uh, like a disgruntled oh, bloody hearing, you know, and then they start to seek out. And then when they find the deaf community, they get involved, they make their own friends. Then you see them blossoming. Yeah. But when, you know, I find so many, I call them coders, that they've not grown up with that very rich, um, I guess, what gift I got and what Peter got um, so that we could choose. I think a lot of these people who are coders, they have the deaf parents, but they don't see themselves as that. And, and I, I wonder too, if that comes from the previous generation, which is mostly a hearing generation, so the grandparents, um, I think the, the grandchildren or the coders see from their grandparents that they view their children as broken, disabled, um, you know, unable to do things. Um, when deaf people are quite capable and can look after their own affairs and, you know, there's, there's, the only difference is it's a different language, but the system um, is to is, it has a lot to be um, an answerable to uh, because they promoted this oral approach to education, um, this whole thing of focus on the ears, the ears are broken, we've got to fix this because the most important thing, if they don't speak, then they'll never have language. And, that, and hearing people didn't understand that sign language is as good as a spoken language. It's, it has everything you can do anything in sign language that you can do in spoken language it, it, there's no limits and if they had only understood that and they still don't understand that most of no. them um and and I, this carries on just because you know this is what coder is really good um because it helps you understand that it's you can't point the finger at your parents deafness that's not where the issues come from because if everything was good and people understood that it was, uh, your parents had a, a great language and they passed it on to you and you were able to communicate, it's the wider world out there that has, uh, is, is mm. ignorant of- you, you, of You've actually hit on something there, Peter, and I just want to read you just a tiny little bit from Mother, Father, Deaf, which is a book I know you, you're very book. familiar with. And I yes. would recommend, highly recommend Mother, Father, Death by Paul Preston to, if you like, what I would call the outer, the wider world, people yeah. like me who want to learn a little bit more. Uh, but, and they do excuse me squinting because my eyesight's not what it was, but just this, <laughs> this little bit stood out for me. Need to make sure I've got the light on it. It's like deafness created certain kinds of situations that wouldn't be there otherwise. It changes the family dynamics, but it's not like deafness itself caused this or caused that. It's what people do, how they react to being deaf that makes the difference. But I would add to that, there's a little bit in a later bit of text there. It is hearing people who make deafness problematic. So I think it's, 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 a, coming together of the two worlds and that's what I realized you know my, my first words when I met Joanne Chester were sorry I I didn't know how to 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 communicate but I mean she made me feel at ease straight away we managed until somebody else came uh she, she was tremendous but it made me realize in normal um, everyday life, people like me avoid those situations. Whereas I had encouraged it, I wanted, I just felt that there was um, an inequality there. And 
and uh, a lack of acceptance and that we should embrace the difference. And I suppose that's what all of these conversations are about, to try and create mm -hmm. better understanding, acceptance. I would love to see Irish Sign Language taught in schools or sign language taught in schools everywhere. Just the basics. Hello, how are you? So that kids at that very early age don't feel different, that they feel included rather than just seeing something, you know, as somebody who grew up seeing silent movies. Mm. Mm. You know, I would love to put whether it's every politician into a world where they, they can't hear or every politician into a wheelchair mm. and, you know, make them fully appreciate the difficulties because it seems to me that minority groups, for lack of a better description, have to fight that much harder for either, as we've had here, Irish Sign Language to be included uh, or enacted. We had the Act brought in in 2017 and it was only in 2020 it was enacted, but we still have somebody who works, if you like, every day in a, uh, a civil position as a, as a guard, a sergeant, and his family being put through stress as they continue this six or seven year campaign for his child to access education fully. Yeah. They, so the work been... that you guys have been doing in, in the community to me just really warms my heart. And I, I just want us to get to that place where we as hearing people understand more and, and work harder, work harder. But you mentioned a, a program earlier, uh, Passport Without a Country. Just, just uh, tell us a, li a little bit about that. Yeah, it, it's a documentary that was made in Australia, it was probably filmed in 1991, and then launched a couple of years later in 93. Um, it was made by uh, Cameron Davies, um, and he worked with Davy. Davies, but um, he worked with uh, Breda Carty. Uh, they are now married. They weren't at the time. Um, Breda is a deaf woman and, his, and a historian. She has a PhD in um, history studies. And so she's very into putting things together for the community. And at the time, um, the university where they worked and studied uh, was putting together a, a documentary on the deaf community. They did two. One was Signs of Life, one's of, one was Signs of Language, and it, they were focused on trying to inform the wider community about the deaf community and about sign language. Um, but on the back of those, Cameron made Passport Without a Country um, as his major work for his degree. We were very, very fortunate that um, we were so involved in the community then and we knew Breda really well and Breda had this idea that maybe we could, maybe Cameron could do this documentary um, to show people what it was like to be a coder and to share the experiences of different coders. So he interviewed people, we didn't all know each other, we knew, some of us knew each other, um, which was also added to the beauty of it really. Um, because we were coming out with very similar things. Uh, and one of the things there, why it was called Passport Without a Country, was this feeling, and we, this links back to us talking about hearing people and deaf people and um, hearing people seem to be the problem. But I think because most deaf people are born to hearing people, um, there's a general feeling that, um, yes, hearing people are our big issue, but unthinkingly, coders, their deaf people's children, um, end up being sort of put into that category as well because we can hear and we're not deaf. So we feel like we belong to deaf people in the deaf community because that's where we were born, that's where we, we grew up, we were raised by deaf people, so we're their offspring. But we we get pushed away. We can't do things with the deaf community socially or in sports and, and, and a whole range of different things. So 
one guy that we didn't know at the time um, who was interviewed actually came up, coined the phrase, um, it feels like um, you, have you, a you have a passport to this country. So you have the culture, you have the language, you have that deep understanding. And yet when you present it to the authorities, they won't let you in. So it was his phrase. It was, it was how he felt about it. Um, but interestingly enough, he is now a man of, in his 80s. He lives not far from us here. That's just pure coincidence. Um, and he still does little interpreting jobs with the local deaf community from time to time. So he, he still connect, he still has this need to connect and like we all do because deaf people raised us. We are- It's in our DNA, I yeah, guess. Yeah. It's, in the, it's in the blood. <laughs> so the, the, the video was a wonderful documentary that was a, was a great discussion starter for work workshops and um, it even created some angst with some people I guess because they thought that we were being critical about things but we were just saying it how it was I you know that's how we saw it because we all spoke from our personal experiences and yeah yeah it created a lot of interesting discussions a lot of that uh, and I think a lot, even though the, the video was made in 91, a lot of the issues it raises um, are still true today. If you if we look at it again and, and listen to what people said, a lot of the issues are still true today. Um, the, the the documentary lasts or has been around quite a while, as I said, um, and but countries took it on all around the world and used it, um, which something we never us. expected but <laughs> it's been a wonderful resource and it's still being used i believe in in places um, cameron has recently put it on to vimeo so it is accessible now on vimeo excellent i must ch i must check it out i'm i'm in a conversation perhaps for another time because i i know that if you like since if you like you you guys grew up within your your if you like parallel communities, things have changed a lot for you, for younger uh, people now, younger de deaf children, and technology will have an inf or has had an influence. Um, so I'd I'd like to revisit that at, at some point, but I'm just curious about the different work that you do within your communities now, because as I suppose we're all getting older, and different life experiences um, impact us with with whether it's family illness, whether it, it's it, it's uh, dealing, you know, the, the, dealing with hospitals, dealing with with medics has always be, been an issue. And where, if you like, coders have been able to facilitate and be go betweens for families. But I know, Peter, you've recently, oh, well, I say recently over recent years, been asked to act as, if you like, a celebrant uh, to f officiate because it brings, you can represent more accurately what somebody wishes to convey. Maybe you can, you can tell us a little bit about that side of your work. Um, yeah, one of the things I did was study uh, to be a celebrant. Uh, I'm not registered as a, as a marriage mm. celebrant, but um, I've done naming ceremonies and I have done um, commitment ceremonies. I have done funeral services or end of life services for people. Um, and, I, and in particular, I think one stands out where um, we, there was a local deaf woman who knew she was going to die. Um, her husband had already died. Unfortunately, both of them uh, died in their 50s from cancer. Um, they had three deaf sons and um, the, the father had died first. The mother, when she got sick, then um, talked to us. We helped her a lot in getting her affairs in order. Judy was more helping her with those things. Um, but in terms of pre preparing for her funeral service, she said to me, I don't want my sons to get my funeral service through an interpreter. I want my sons to receive this, the service 
directly from the person who is running it and who is taking the service. So she said, I want that to be you. Um, so that was a, a, a huge honor. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I did, I thought, yes, I get it. I get it. Absolutely. So I, I did the service for her. She wasn't a particularly um, religious woman, but I talked to the sons and her, and I had a good sense of how much she, you know, she wanted in the service and how they wanted it done. So we did do things like, you know, um, instead of a reading, I made a reference to a, a reading from the Bible and I made, you know, we, we did the, um, I have watery eyes because of the weather here at the moment. So I'm not tearing up. <laughs> just every now and then I have to brush away those tears. That was just on cue, wasn't it? <laughs> well, it, 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 it's a funny thing because when you, when, as you say, it is an honour to, to be that person for a family and it can get very emotional. So to be yes, able to hold that yes. space and do what is required can be quite challenging. Exactly. exactly. So being able to present the service, um, to sort of bring it in summary, um, I had a number of young people come up to me afterwards and it was obviously a new experience for them. They hadn't actually been to a service. They'd sat there and thought, oh, Peter must be here to do the interpreting. And it took them a few minutes to realize that, that, oh, no, he's actually doing it. He's running the service. By the end of the service, I had a number of them come up to me and they were a lot younger than me. They said to me, I want you to do my funeral service. And I said, well, I doubt that I'm going to be here when that happens. Um, but I also had someone come up to me and say, you know, your explanation of that Bible reading and the way you signed the Lord's Prayer I went to a Catholic school all my life, and this is the first time that I've understood it. That, the meaning of the it. The meaning of yeah. it. That, you know, is, I just made me feel, this is what it's all about. You know, deaf people live their lives not understanding so much of what they see day in day out what it's what's been drummed into them they still don't understand what it means and what why we do this it's all just by rote um and and to add to that too i think many 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 times you will see someone who is a good signer but because of the setting they choose to use their voice along with signing now when that happens it pushes you right up into english so the fluency of the language is not there. The way Peter did it for these funerals that he's done, a few of, uh, like that, it's in pure Auslan. And he makes me stand on the side and voice it, like to interpret it for any of the hearing participants. And that's when you see the true beauty of the language. And you know that expression, you could drop a pin and you would hear it drop to the floor? There not a blink, nobody's eyes blinked. They were glued. And I just thought that's what it really means. And it was, it's just, yeah. And the three boys just thought it was so wonderful. And it was just the talk of, I never realized the Lord's prayer says, you know, kingdom come. I always thought it meant that, the land, no. The way Peter explained it and interpreted it, it was about God's rule, you know, and it all made sense. And it was just such a joy to see them understand something, the light being switched on. Anyway, I thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> Sorry. But it's so, it's so important, isn't it, to be able to connect at that level yeah. through the first language where yes. it matters most yes yes definitely indeed Jeff, judy's brother um now well, one of judy's brothers um the one in melbourne uh is not well um and he's terminal he's terminally ill um he uh, we, we've spent many time many months down there now um we travel back and forth helping him with different things um and one of the things he has done is organize what he wants for his funeral service um and again he has said to me i, I don't want what happened at 
my wife's service to happen. Um, I want my service done in my language. So I, I'd like you to do it for me. Um, so I said to him, well, I think I might be knocking on the lead and calling on you to join me, you know? So we've had a bit of a joke about it and we've laughed about it, but you know, he, he um, has had got me lined up um, to, to do his funeral service. And I, and I think with, with my brother too, he, he really appreciates our involvement in being committed to making sure that he's, he's on track with about his illness because so many medical appointments, no interpreter turns up, the big hospital system, um, all this COVID problem, you know, he has, he's, hasn't been allowed to have someone support him walking into a hospital. No, only the patient. You know, all those barriers that he's had to face. And, you know, you have to wonder about, you know, the, the glory of technology. At least he can FaceTime me in a hospital and I can assist and explain what he's trying to say to the people at the front door and all that sort of stuff. But what he has been able to, to do is with, with native signers, I've been able to help him get to that point of truly understanding what's going on with his illness. And he's been able to just go, right, I, am, I understand fully and it is what it is. I will do what I can. I need to know what I have to do beforehand. And he's now so ready and in so prepared. And I'm so proud of him of having that attitude. He just doesn't sit there living in fear of what is to come. And he's just so accepting of knowing if I get all of this done sooner than later, what he has left, he's now able to enjoy what he can. And, and it's, it's nice to see him like that because he's making it so easy for himself. He's a role model for the children who are dreading the thought and he's going, it's okay. You know, we're all going to go one day. I know what my circumstances will be. And he's got a really good understanding that I tell you what, some of the interpreters that have turned up, I'm sure they're ordering fish and chips from a restaurant compared to what he should be told about his medication. I mean, that's an extreme example, but some of them should not be interpreting, should not. They don't. They don't uh, uh, just deliver the language. There's absolutely no cultural bridging that's going on. All those facial expressions that are so important to us uh, and their readback ability is very poor. And they're from non, you know, non-signing backgrounds. They don't have that fluency. They're new, they're young, they're, um, they're just not masters 